Uh, I'm Tony, I'm the uh, candidate for uh, One Nation for the Nango electorate. And uh, after travelling around the uh, district, the electorate, it was very important and very clear a lot of uh, messages were coming out from farmers and many other people. Uh, the biggest uh, issue that we have with farming is farming rights. And tonight we've got a great panel and I'll introduce this panel very shortly. I've been living in this area for about nine years um, with my family. I've got a young 12 year old and one of the things I ask my 12 year old all the time is, what's his vision? What's his uh, dream? And he goes, what do you mean dad? I said, no, what's your dream? My dream when I left school was to become a professional musician. That's all I wanted to do. And uh, I had that great opportunity, some magnificent musicians playing for the Queen, Diana, the Glen Miller Band. I don't I got out of the military, then I came back and I did a bit more tourism and at present I work in the disability sector throughout the uh, whole South Burnett region. The same once again, and it's not happening. So how do we do it? At the moment our governments, governments, they just want to take and take and take. And that's why we're here tonight, to give you this opportunity to listen to a, f a fantastic panel, but also at the end of it, to have time for some questions. So you've got that choice to answer us back and we will respond with some of those questions this evening. This election is a very important election because if we don't make the changes now, you know what's gonna happen in another four years. We're gonna be in the same spot or worse off. And we need to take your voice back to parliament. We wanna hear what you have to say. You're the owners of the land. You know exactly what's happening. I don't, I'm not out there with you, but I can guess. Last year, I had the privilege of sadly giving out the $3,000 to farmers who were collapsing in my arms and crying during that drought. $3,000. And yet, lately, this government spent over $314 billion, and what have we got to show for it? Very little. OK? That's it. And we could have used that more wisely. That $314 billion could have been used a lot better than what it's been used. So I'd like to uh, introduce the first um, uh, panellist, Dan McDonald. I'll just give you a little uh, bio about uh, Dan. He's 48, um, lives with his wife of 24 years and three children, approximately 160 kilometres northwest of Charlieville. Like so many people in rural Queensland, Dan and his wife, Katrina, have invested their working life of blood, sweat and tears into producing their own freehold property so as to provide their family's livelihood by breeding and grazing livestock. While not one of the most willing students at school, Dan lives by the principles of respect, observing those around him, looking, listening, and having a go as the means of learning life's valuable lessons. Dan's key interests are, in order of priority, his wife, his children, and everything that makes up his livelihood from machinery to animals, to the governance of not only his livelihood, but the governance of our society as a whole. Acknowledging the sacrifices made by our forefathers and the selfless conviction of men and women of our current defence forces, Dan cannot and will not sit back and watch our government throw away our rights and freedoms so hard fought won and defended by our nation's most courageous people. Welcome, Dan. Thank you, everybody. Can anyone hear me without this? Yep. I do have a habit of speaking rather loudly, so. Uh, okay, so we're here to talk about property rights, and the first thing I'd like to say is that um, there's a bit of confusion around what property rights actually are. Everyone thinks that, okay, I've got property and then I've got rights. And regularly, if I ask people, okay, what, what are property rights? They go, oh, well, I'm not so sure. You know, it's what I can do. There's one fundamental thing that we all need to understand, and that is that our rights in relation to freehold land particularly, this is what we're talking about here. Our rights are our property. We own them. 
Okay, they're not something that just floats around for government to steal bits of for your neighbour or the bloke down the road to take advantage of. It is your property, okay? Your, your right to use your land is an element of your property that you own, you paid for it, and essentially it is the most valuable element of property that you will ever own. Because if you take away the right to use your land, the land itself is worth nothing. Absolutely nothing. It doesn't matter how good the soil is, you know, what, what the vegetation's like, how good the rainfall is. If you don't have the right to use it, it's worthless. You derive the benefit from that land out of your right to use it. Whether you produce food with it, whether you graze cattle, whether you adjust it or lease it out to somebody else. At the end of the day, you and your community derive their economic existence from your right to use your land. That is paramount. It is so important. So I'll just give you a brief outline of, of my situation, I guess. Um, I, I purchased a property, our property, about 2003 to run a grazing business. So at that time, I sought out grazing land. Now many of you are probably aware of the fact that throughout Australia land is classified by government into primary land uses. Whether you know that or not, your, your little parcel of earth has a primary land use in the eyes of government. Whether it be residential, commercial, agricultural, it has a primary land use. So I thought I was doing the right thing. I wanted to run a grazing business, so I purchased grazing land west of Charleville, and with the whole desire to run a grazing business. So that's what I set about doing, grazing livestock. Out where we are, I'm not sure what, if you're aware of it, but we have vegetation called mulga. That's a scrubby type of a tree. It's hardly a, hardly a millable timber or a fantastic looking forest, but it's very good forage for livestock. And that's essentially what our livestock industry lives off is off that vegetation. Just like somewhere around here, you might, have, um, you might have grass, you might have a paddock of lacina, you might have just native pasture to, to, you know, to run your grazing business. Out there, we have mulga. So I purchased mulga, classified for grazing, and I set about grazing in 2004. Now in 2014, along come the government and said to me, what are you doing? What's going on here? We've noticed satellite changes to the vegetation on your land. And I said, well, I'm running a grazing business, you know. That's what I bought it for. Anyway, the long and the short of that is that over the next three years, they set about prosecuting me in the court for using my vegetation to feed my cows. Vegetation that I paid for, that I bought, and I bought it specifically to run a grazing business. At the end of that prosecution process, I was ordered to pay $112,468.82 because I'd been using my vegetation to feed my cows. The decision itself coming out of, um, just to backpedal a bit there, I, that proceeding commenced in the magistrate's court, which I represented myself. Um, it went to, I appealed to the district court, represented myself, and I appealed then further to the Supreme Court and represented myself. I did end up with a, a small measure of, of success, but I certainly can't call it just. However, within their decision, they actually said that the vegetation in question was not mine to use as I saw fit. Now you might say to yourself, well, how the hell does that work out? I said that, <laughs> most people, rational people would. I bought it, it was classified for grazing. However, I've been prosecuted by the administrator, by government, and they've actually turned around and said, well, it wasn't your property to use. Now nowhere in the process of purchasing the property or at any time up to that prosecution, did anyone from government say, oh, by the way, you don't have the right to use that vegetation. They just come along with a sledgehammer. 
So as you can imagine, that's led me to a, uh, a point where I'm fairly passionate about property rights and particularly private property rights in relation to land because that, as I said, is the most fundamental thing that we ever buy. So that's where I am at the moment. Um, in representing myself, I, I've literally spent thousands of hours studying law, case law and legislation. One of the most concerning parts of that is that the legislation itself actually still says that I've got the right to use my vegetation. And I'll just read you something that's it's not coming out of my mind. It's, this is a government document from the Land Title Practice Manual. Now, what the Land Title Practice Manual is, is basically the book of rules that government use in the administration of land, of all our land, whether you've got a house in town or 50,000 acres at Longridge. So, so what it says, this is coming from the government's mouth, for freehold land, it says, outright freehold title is where the land has been alienated from the state and the ownership rests with, an, with the individual owner for an estate in fee simple. It goes on to say, this simply means that the state has no right or claim to the land and should the state require the land, it must acquire it from the owner either by negotiation or by resumption and payment of compensation. That's current as of today. Yet I've been prosecuted and told that I didn't have the right to use my land. Most people would say, how the hell can this be? That's the position we're in. The impact of what government have done to us, um, I can't really put into words. It's, it's like the main thing you work for in your whole life and it's just gone, taken away. I'd like to explain to you how this has all come about. In my research, the first thing I wanted to do when this all happened was work out where the hell is this coming from? Why, why is this? You know? You get hit with a sledgehammer, you want to see who's on the end of the bloody handle. So I set about doing a lot of research and I'll just give you a brief history of how this has come about. So back in 1996, the Queensland National Party leader Rob Borbidge became the Premier of Queensland. Many of you would remember that. In that same year, John Howard became the Prime Minister of Australia. In 1997, John Howard's government agreed to have Australia comply with the Kyoto Protocol. Many of you may have never heard of that. It's an international agreement with the UN. In accordance with that federal government agreement, or commitment, should I say, on the 5th of November in 1997, the Queensland National Party, that's Borbage's government, signed a partnership agreement with the Commonwealth to access fund, funds from the Commonwealth Natural Heritage Trust Fund, which was $1.1 billion from the sale of Telstra shares. So to be precise, on behalf of Queensland, that agreement was signed by the National Party leader, Rob Borbage, it was signed by the National Party MP and Minister for Environment, Brian Littleproud. And it was signed by the Queensland National Party MP and Minister for Natural Resources, Howard Hobbs. On behalf of the Commonwealth, that agreement was signed by the Liberal Party leader and Prime Minister, John Howard. Liberal Party MP and Environment Minister, Robert Hill. And the Federal National Party Deputy Leader and Primary Industries Minister, John Anderson. So if you ask yourself, well, well, why is any of this relevant? So what? You'd be unaware of the fact that it was this agreement that imposed obligations on the Queensland State Government to implement land use controls across all of Queensland. That is the government regulation of vegetation, water and all facets of land use. It was this agreement that brought about the start of erosion and theft of our property under the banner of the Integrated Planning Act in 1997. 
Now in June 1998, Peter Beattie became the Premier of Queensland. Many of you would remember that. Throughout this time, lured by the flow of cash from the National Heritage Trust Fund, ongoing pressure from the federal government to increase land use controls, such as vegetation clearing regulations and water regulation, brought about the Vegetation Management Act 1999 and the Queensland Water Act 2000. So the period from 2000 to 2004 saw continued pressure from the Howard government to further increase vegetation controls. And as such, the Queensland Labor government, the Beattie government, signed another bilateral agreement to deliver an extension to that original Nat Natural Heritage Trust Fund. That was signed in June of 2004. For Queensland, that agreement was signed by the Queensland Labor MP acting as um, Premier Terry McEnroth, and for the Commonwealth, it was signed by the Federal Liberal Party MP and Minister for the Environment, Dr David Kemp, and it was signed by the Federal National Party MP and Minister for Agriculture, Warren Truss. That agreement was conditioned on amendments to the Queensland Vegetation Management Act that brought about further significant impacts for freehold land. And as you'd all remember, the Queensland Labor Party maintained those commitments for the further eight years. With a brief moment of slight reprieve under the state LNP government, we've faced those impacts right up until today. So that's where this comes from. And the primary thing we need to recognise out of that is that we can't just bash the Labor Party for tree clearing laws or violations of property rights in this state. Because essentially the National Party have, and Liberal Party have been behind this right from the outset. Indeed, they are the drivers of it. And it really matters not who was in power at a state level, it was the Feds driving it all along, as they do now. Property, as I've said, it's, it's land that's alienated from the state and they clearly say themselves that if, they say that they have no right or claim to it. And if they want a right or claim to it, that they must compensate us. Clearly government are negligent in their administration of our property. There's no other word to, ex to, to describe that. Dishonest. Negligence is, is careless disregard, and that's exactly what is happening. The, the, the institution, I, I don't like that word, but the institution of property must be protected because it's what we all live for. Many people have died for it. Most of us spend our life working to pay for it. And then perhaps it's handed on to, to our children. But it is the single biggest burden upon your existence is having somewhere to live. And if you're in farming, it's somewhere to generate your livelihood. We cannot afford to not protect that. And in protecting property, we're not opposed to environmental control at all. As much as I don't agree with a lot of the policy, and I would say quite happily that much of it is, for want of a better word, bullshit. The fact is, what I'm focusing on here is the fact that we have to protect our property. If government acting as the administrator want our land for conservation, they have a duty to compensate us. Government act for the people. If if the people, the voting masses, want our land, they should be happy to pay for it. And if they're not, government have an obligation to say, well, sorry, go to hell, because we're not stealing. That's how it should be. But of course, that's not what's happening. Now, to resolve this injustice, we only have two solutions. One is political, 
and the other one is judicial. And of course, I think you would all agree that the political solution should be far less painful and more appropriate than a judicial one. I'm sure many of you have heard cases, horror stories of judicial proceedings becoming nothing but a gravy train for the legal fraternity. It's for that reason that we should actually be able to get a political solution. We all have a choice to be part of that solution, or if we're not choosing to be part of that solution, we will indeed be part of the problem because there is nothing in the middle. It's one thing to say, oh, well, you know, I don't know a lot about it. I'm not going to do much about it. I'll leave it to someone else. But you are actually being part of the problem by taking that, making that choice. The, the most easily accessible way that we can all assist in finding a political solution is to support political parties that are actually working for us. Now, I haven't come here to push a political wheelbarrow for anybody. But what I will do is give credit where it's due and I'll give condemnation where it's due. And if we keep voting for political parties that have got us to this point, we can well and truly expect more of the same. Indeed, we will get more of the same because it's not over. The taking of our property is not finished yet. Where I live, we're, we're in the Murray-Darling Basin and we're on the, the eastern edge of the Lake Eyre Basin. I gather, and someone will correct me if I'm wrong, you may well be in the Great Barrier Reef catchment here. Is that right? So, so many of you would be aware that government have legislated regulations for the Great Barrier Reef catchment, which will have a profound impact on all your properties in the catchment. Particularly from a grazing perspective, you are going to be facing over the next three years regulated minimum ground cover. So therefore that really equates to the fact that government are going to tell you how much grass you can use, which comes back to how many livestock you can run. And of course, if you don't comply with that, well, you can look forward to getting dragged through the court and penalised. That same regime is already earmarked to be rolled out in the Lake Eyre Basin, the Murray-Darling Basin, and the Gulf Rivers catchment. It will effectively cover the whole state. So if you're someone that's sitting on, um, should I say, developed grazing land with paddocks full of grass, and you think, well, vegetation laws haven't affected me, it's coming. It is going to affect you. Like it or lump it, it's on the way. That is why it is imperative to fight back now, not 20 years down the track when you've suffered, your community has suffered, and then you're trying to claw back from a position way behind. If we all knew how bad vegetation laws were really going to be back in 1999, well, perhaps we wouldn't have them like we do now. There's been a profound reliance upon peak industry bodies, I call them so-called peak industry bodies, to represent us and fight the fight for us. And without wanting to point fingers and point blame, look where that has got us. It has not helped. They have actually been part of the problem. The same thing can be said for putting reliance on the major political parties that have historically stood up for, or purported to stand up for, rural and regional Australia. This is where we've got. So as I said, everyone has a choice and the easiest option that every one of us has is on election day. 
you don't have to spend hours, you don't have to spend weeks or days researching and trying to fight back, you don't have to turn up in a courtroom, but you do get a choice when you put pen to paper on who you choose to elect you. So all I say there is please think carefully because something needs to change. Okay, thank you. If you can hear me, I've got a loud voice too. Thanks, Dan. Um, the next uh, uh, guest we've got is the Senator Malcolm Roberts. Uh, Senator Roberts graduated with honours engineering degree from University of Queensland in 76 and then decided he needed to learn something he, and worked as an underground coalface miner in five regions across Australia. Engineer in America and travelled all over 50 states before returning back to Australia where he quickly rose through management ranks to be a mine manager at a young age. He obtained a master's degree in business from, from the University of Chicago and won American awards for business studies. Returned to Australia and led development of Australia's largest underground coal mining project in regional Queensland. The mine made the mine made many leadership in, uh, innovations and set many records before Malcolm established himself as a consultant working internationally to turn around business and develop leaders. Having been taught about <coughs> atmospheric gases as part of his studies, he realised that government claims about climate are ridiculous, as most farmers know. He then researched voluntary and held government agencies, universities, politicians and journalists accountable. The results startled him and Pauline asked him to be a Senate candidate with One Nation. His focus in Parliament is on the basics, restoring Australia's pro productive capacity and integrity of governance and restoring our economic and national sovereignty. He adopted his policy of restoration of compensation for farmers after entering, entering the Senate in 2016, after finding government had stolen farmers' rights to use their land. Malcolm is passionate about farmers taking control of their farms back from the bureaucrats and restoring farmers' control over the land they own and about farming. Can you please welcome Senator Malcolm Roberts? Who owns a house? Put your hand up, please. Who rents a house? And I know you. How would you and Dale like it if the government came in, took your kitchen and a couple of bedrooms and a living room off you, said you can't use it anymore? How would you like that? That's what they've done to Dan McDonald. That's what they are doing to coastal householders in New South Wales and attempted to do in Queensland. That is what's going on. This is not the future, it's already here. They're stealing property rights, your rights to use your land. I want to commend Dan for a start. I haven't seen a cleaner farm in my life. Everything is organised, the gates well hinged, the, the locks immaculate. He is tidy, but he's logical, he's clean and clear in his thinking. He, I just came here to, to back up what he said. He has got it entirely correct on the stealing of property rights. So I'm going to talk about, first of all, the conf confirming what Dan said. Secondly, widening the issue. I'm going to talk about how it was stolen, then talk about widening the issue, and then talk about some solutions. And I've got 10 minutes, so I've, I'm going to be uh, rushing. But we've got plenty of time for Q&A. We'll stay here all night if we have to, right? Yes. Okay. It is about the rights to use your land. Whether you're a householder or a farmer or a business owner, it's about the rights to use your land and government stealing of it. Before entering the Senate, as Tony said, I worked voluntarily exposing what was going on underneath this climate claim and be, be completely clear about it. It is a rort, and I'll tell you more in a minute. So what happened then was that I became aware of what had happened to steal farmers' property rights, the rights to use their land. It is exactly as, John, as uh, Dan said. John Howard came to power in 96. The UN's Kyoto Protocol was passed in 1996. The agreement was signed around the world. And what the Liberal government had to do, they recognised that they couldn't reduce carbon dioxide by shutting down factories and cars. So they came up with another way of complying with the UN's edict. 
and that was to stop the clearing of land because everything green on this planet absorbs carbon dioxide. It's entirely natural. And so they shut down the clearing of land to maintain the, the absorption of carbon dioxide. It's had no impact whatsoever on the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But that's what John Howard's government did. But it was enabled, as I've been told by, by a barrister whose, whose uh, judgment I value and advice I value, that it was enabled by the courts. But it was driven by John Howard's Liberal National Government to steal land to comply with an international agreement. End of story. And then it was used by the state governments, national and liberals, as well as the Labor Party, to steal more rights off land, as the other, as the other people here will, will attest in a, in a few minutes. When I saw John Howard lose power, I wrote him a letter thanking him for his service over 30 years. It was a sincere, short letter. I got a letter back saying thank you very much. Seven years later, in 2014, after doing my research on climate, I wrote him another letter. I rescind my first letter because you stole people's property rights. And here's what really hurts, because I get angry when I see what's happened to people like Dan and what's happening to people around the country. Here's what really hurts. In 2014, seven years after being booted out of government, John Howard stood up in a lecture in London and said that on the issue of climate science, he is agnostic, he doesn't know. This was all done with no science. And yet we were told there was science there. When I got into the Senate, I accelerated holding people accountable on the science claims. And I cross-examined the CSIRO. And the CSIRO, we haven't got time to discuss it now, but I'll happily discuss it afterwards in detail. The CSIRO has no evidence that carbon dioxide from human activity affects the climate and needs to be cut. None. Zip. I'll go through that in detail. We have been, we have been the victims of a massive fraud, and it is still going on. And that fraud has been used to steal his land, used to steal coastal residence property in New South Wales and Queensland. I didn't know that. I used to be a Liberal supporter. Now I'm running with One Nation. Why? Because this injustice has to stop. It's now going on wider. Sharon Lose will talk about the other legislation. There are five or six pieces of legislation we've identified, aren't there, Dan? That are stealing your rights to use your land. And as Dan said, if you want to steal my land for, to protect a koala or protect native grasses, go right ahead, but compensate me because I bought the damn stuff with my money and it is mine. There's been no talk about compensation. One thing further, the Howard... Howard Liberal National Government did. They recognised that they'd have to pay compensation for stealing property rights if the federal government stole those property rights. What did they do? They did a deal, as Dan explained, with the National Liberal Party government in this state under Rob Borbidge to steal that land because the states don't pay compensation. How dishonest is that? Can you see why I, can't, I just get so angry with this? So it's been broadened since then under Beatty, under Bly, and now under Palaszczuk. And, and, and uh, Sharon Lose will tell you about that. And I know a, a reputable scientist on land clearing, on the protection of, legis uh, protection of vegetation, who has told me that he did research, I think it was about $10 million worth of research, paid for by the taxpayers of Queensland through the state government. Then he was told to suppress it, hide it because it didn't fit the narrative from Peter Beattie's government. Destroy the evidence because that enabled them then to go ahead and put the native vegetation protection legislation in. Deceit, 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 dishonesty. So let's go then to what drives this. Dan hinted at it by talking about the UN. This is about getting control of land. How do they do that? Well, they demonize farmers. Have you heard now about the barrier reef reg of protection legislation? the native, native vegetation legislation, what they're saying is that farmers are destroying the environment. Think about that. They're saying farmers are clearing land when they shouldn't be because, and causing the topsoil to wash off. What's the number one asset of every farmer? Soil. Do you want to see it flush down the creek, Jim? No, you don't. You protect it because you want to maximise the value for when you retire and for handing over to your kids. Or, as David was happy to do, hoping to do, sell it and move to the coast and move into retirement. 
That's fact. And yet they're saying farmers are happy to have topsoil run off their land. Rubbish. And I'm happy to go into the details that I and G Senator Jared Rennick, who's a liberal, but I give him full credit, he and I worked together in an inquiry recently to expose these academics for the charlatans they are and the politicians who go on their paid advice. A farmer does not want to put excess chemicals, excess fertiliser on the land. Why don't you want to do that? Because it's bloody expensive. Thank you, Gary. This doesn't make sense, and yet they say that farmers are polluting the Barrier Reef with chemicals, with insecticides, with nitrogen fertilisers. They're not. And I'm happy to go through the results of the uh, investigations that Ser Senator Jared Rennick and I did in, in uh, Senate inquiry. This is about getting control of land. When you have control of land, you have control of a society. You remove freedoms. Secure property rights to the use of land are inherent to, to freedom in society. That's known throughout history. That's what they're doing. And they're controlling it through lies and misrepresentations. So the solutions, just quickly. First of all, we need to develop an awareness within the farming community, within the whole community in Australia, of what is really going on. This is naked theft of your rights to use your land. You know that, Robert. Jim knows that. This is just straight out theft. And what we're calling on is restoration of your rights or compensation. Because if you want to build a koala habitat and use my land, sure, go ahead. But as a society, if that's, the, if that's where you value things, that's your policy, then pay me compensation. Pay Dan compensation. Dan's happy to, to, to protect whatever society wants. But if that's, the, if that's the decision of the group of people that form Australia, compensate him for stealing what he's, what he's lost. So we need to develop awareness because I believe the solution will only be political. The courts have been complicit in this. I can tell you more stories in the Q&A about that. We need to bust the myth that farmers and the environment don't coexist. The future of our... It's actually worse than that. It's the, the, the narrative from the UN is that humans and nature don't coexist. It's an anti-human agenda. It's implicit in everything they do. So the future of civilization, if we destroy our environment, what will our civilization look like? It'll be terrible. So our future of our civilization requires protecting the environment. And if you think about it, who looks after the environment better? Someone is scraping for a meal in a third world country and is, is so, so stretched for resources and time that, pardon the French, they shit in the creek? Or someone here who understands the environment and can protect the environment? Which one? So the future of the environment depends upon protecting our civilization. The two go hand in hand. And I'm damned if I'm, if I'm going to be told I'm not part of nature. One of the defining traits of humans, every human, is the fact that we care so much about our planet and that humans care. And that's brought me out of ten, uh, 10 minutes, so I'm just going to say, finish with this. This is about being part of a, a process of capturing and controlling our freedoms. This is about taking away our freedoms and controlling life. It's happening with our energy sector. It's happening with our water. It's happening with our property. It's happening with regulations that are now starting to dictate to us what we can do, when we can do it, and who we can do it with, whether or not we can even do it. Please stand up. Happy to ask lot, answer lots of questions in quick Q&A. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Senator Malcolm Roberts. Um, as you can see, we're very passionate about this, about the, the farmers. We're, we're talking about these rights. We've got to get your voice back there. We've got to make these changes, because if we don't make these changes, I look at my 12-year-old and go, what's the, what's the future? What's the dream? And it goes back to our kids, doesn't it, as well? What's their dream for the future? Um, <clears throat> our next uh, panellist is Sharon Lose. Got it right, good. Um, Sharon's a, a business operator on the grazier on the land. Uh, she's also got so frustrated, uh, like many of us, to put up a hand and say, I've got to fight this. I've got to fight for a party um, and go with One Nation because she's frustrated too. And uh, she'll tell you the story. Uh, not far from here, up in the North Burnett area, okay, which is not that far. And I'll hand over to Sharon.
Good afternoon, everyone. The rights to use our land is underpinning the economic strength in our communities. We're all very well aware how rural communities are struggling at the moment, and it's all the imposition on our businesses that is stopping us from producing food and fibre. And most of you, if you come off the land, are, are already aware of the different legislations that we have to work for, work with, that is causing that problem. I have conducted a partnership with my husband in a beef cattle enterprise and timber production for approximately 30 years. During this time, we raised three children while watching the right to manage our land be stripped away. The impact of this started late in the 1990s. Piece by piece, as state and federal legislation was passed and amendments added, as much as 30 in the Nature Conservation and Other Act, they say, the productive capacity of our business was reduced somewhat relative to the physical loss of the land regulated out of use. Our business localities, one property is on the eastern coastal belt in the Wide Bay on the eastern fall of the Great Divide Range quite diverse to our property on the Western Downs in the Briglow Belt. So different um, legislation applies to each of the properties which causes us management issues. We can and do strategically plan for fire, flood and drought. What we can't plan for is how to work with restrictive legislation that is taking the cream off of our business to be able to prepare for these routine, not routine, but cyclic weather events that cause impositions on our business and our bottom line. In 2002, we, funded a local, we founded a local land care group on the Western Downs and worked with two lots of funding for landholders in pasture and quality, water quality projects. Repasturing, deep ripping, water diversion, testing. 20 odd years ago, when dollars were actually spent on on ground works for pro productive and environmentally sustainable product projects. In the past, DPI and DNR worked with landholders. Now, if you're like ourselves, we try and never find ourselves in a DNR office or get very nervous when a vehicle comes in through our front gate. So why has this changed and what has caused it? Dan touched on it and unbeknownst to us when our major um, property fight started in the 2000, around 2002 to 2004 when it ramped up, our property issues was tied into the Kyoto Protocol. What the federal government had promised an overseas interest, the UN, is affecting us and our business to the state to the extent that we will completely take our business away from us and our life's work away from us. So before I start on that, like everyone else here, um, we've got to work with PMAVs. We've got Category A, Category B, Category C, Category R. If you're lucky, you've got a PMAV, Category X, and if you have a sort of breathe a sigh of relief and say, okay, we, we locked our property in and you think everything's good. Well, unfortunately, no, it's not. There's a federal legislation that can override that state legislation. And unbeknownst to you, until you get a fine in the mail, which will be quite substantial, federal law of the EPBC Act, it um, overrides the state EPBC Act in, and everyone would know the simple terms of the blue trigger mapping which now they've turned to green just to confuse everybody. But what it actually means is if you look at your property map, you have some light green now trigger mapping on it. You must get a um, registered consultant from the government's registration list. You must enlist them to do property truthing, ground truthing, identify that you don't have a flora species before you can put a plough in the ground. To do this, um, on average, you could be looking at, uh, well, for example, the, the exemption permit, uh, not the exemption permit, the permit to put in to get this looked at, you're looking at 500. Um, to hire a consultant, you're looking at an average of 1,400 a day for about 10 hectares. 
This is just to get the use of that area of land that has been identified for a Pacific flora. We have um, had situations where uh, grain growers, farmers that have been tilling land for 100 years have been identified with blue trigger mapping on their, on their farming areas. Now, how could that be if they've been turning the soil for that long? Well, unfortunately for them, they strategically keep shade lines. So within those shade lines, there's been a flora identified. The radius that goes around that takes out that section of, of farming land. If you've got shade lines uh, grid, gridded through your property, as good grain growers um, do, you can effectively take out nearly 80% of one farming area, one paddock, just by these blue trigger maps. So that's probably a very simple um, explanation, but believe me, it's a, a lot more detail. But the short of it is you have to engage with the consultant at your cost to, um, in effect, say that you're not guilty of, of having this, for the want of a better word. So, you know, you're proven guilty, before, you've got to prove your innocence. You've got to get that flora unidentified off your land so you can go back to your farming strategically as you always have. So that's, that's um, vegetation management uh, legislation and the blue trigger mapping, the EPBC, state and federal. The federal um, is, is quite more extensive and I was told by a consultant yesterday that uh, there is no mapping to help you out to identify the federal implications of that act. You simply get a fine in the mail when you find out you've done it wrong. The good part of that story at the moment is, unless you're in the Western Downs, it's more like it's more to grasslands ecosystems. So unless you're in the Central West or the um, Western Downs, you are pretty safe at this stage. But we thought our vegetation, our trees were um, in the firing line. Our grasslands are also in the firing line. Like all of us, we're looking to regrass, repasture coming out of droughts. This um, is going to impact on our ability to plough and regrass because we're not going to be able to do that under this legislation just because it has been prior identified to having an ecosystem of a certain type of grass species. And if you're fortunate enough to be on a generational grazing property or farm, you think, OK, we've got photographic evidence that this is what it was like then, so... You know, that is what the government wants. We have to prove that we are not changing the biodiversity of our land. Well, no, it doesn't work like that. They only take that back 16 years. And so it doesn't matter if you've got photographs from 100 years ago showing that that paddock was nice open grazing land with that type of species of grass. That's not what they work on. They work on what their herbarium predicts, projects, um, models was in that paddock 16 years ago. If you want to do, uh, on, as a sideline, a lot of people do timber harvesting. So on that one, we have to work with a code of practice for native forest timber production. I've been told that this is the easiest one. I haven't um, read the manual, but... Um, you have to know your code. You have to abide by your code. It's only 90 pages with quite foreign terminology and it's probably at that stage that most graziers give up and think, no, we'll, we'll just leave that, those logs standing in the paddock. So again, it's a situation where we are presented with a bombardment of codes, legislations, information that we have to decipher. We hand it to, to a consultant. It's costing us money up front, straight away, just another imposition on our business when we're all coming out of drought or what, for whatever natural disaster comes along and we're trying to again work with all the legislation and acts and codes. Okay, so bringing us to what brought me forward to start um, fighting and talking about property rights. Back in 2002, 2004, uh, partial, part of our property in the um, South Burnett is a grazing lease. Now, grazing leases, which originally in 100 years ago were grazing farms or um, 
I've lost the terminology, there is so many rolling, well, it's now into a rolling term lease. There is, and that's another whole uh, minefield. There are so many different term names for property holders um, to work with. And again, the goalposts keep moving as they do. Um, so going back to it, in 2002, we, we, were, um, we received a notice from the government that they were not going to renew our renewable grazing lease. When we looked into it, it was going over to, it was designated National Park. How can they do that? How can they take our property off of us? We purchased it, we have a title deed, we have a mortgage applicable. Well, they can. It's going back to that 1997 um, deal between the federal Howard government and the state Beatty government that gave them the ability to take our property without compensating us. So we fought that. We went into the Supreme Court and we won. We got a judicial review on the um, terminology and we won. After that, they changed the goalposts. They put some amendments in there to the Nature Conservation Act. So now we don't have the right to go back in to fight it legally. Mind you, we're looking at that avenue again because as time goes past, 20 years has gone past very quickly and in four years' time, our lease comes up for renewal again. Even though on our title deed, it says it's a rolling term lease. So a rolling term lease, if it's 20 or 30, the first term it just simply rolls over. So you effectively get 40 to 60 years, whatever it was originally. And it's at that second time that you have to actually put in a renewal. But we have already been told, and um, through freedom of information, uh, we are very aware that um, we have another big legal battle on our hands because they are going to take it on the December 2024. We are simply supposed to pack our bags, load up all our animals and drive away off of a property that Robert's grandfather <coughs> bought in, in 1916 simply because of a deal that the government did to wrangle their way out of buying properties. 64% of Queensland is leasehold land. In our situation, 82 properties were designated and taken under this. Some, prop, some people, some owners are already gone. They, we put a landholder group together in the um, early 2000s. Some people went too hard, they walked away. As you do, it's very, it's very difficult. You know, 20 years of fighting this, sitting in the back of your mind. Whatever it's out. So again, if you put it in a nutshell, the government control land use, not you. Is that a fair point? Yep, yeah, the government uh, control the land use, not you. The next uh, person we've got up is Greg. Uh, Greg comes from Condamine, uh, just down on the south here. Um, and he's also brought up uh, David, uh, also a land user. So he's going to introduce himself and uh, do a couple of questions with David um, in this next session for you. Well, thanks. Thanks, Tony. And thank you, Malcolm, for the invitation. Um, my name's Greg Preby. I originally hail from Moola, which is uh, northeast Downs, and a uh, beautiful bit of country there. And uh, I now live on the just on the east, east side of Oakey. And uh, my background is on agribusiness and also education. And uh, I studied through, through uh, yeah, studied uh, ag science, um, went on to education. I did Chinese Mandarin, I did history and a whole range of things. So I sort of got to work in some very interesting industries and a nice cross-section of dealing with different people. And uh, the reason that I sort of got into, well, the reason I stood up for One Nation is I had a personal situation where, um, where I observed local government and, and state MP neglect. And, uh, and in dealing with that, I discovered probably even a greater issue, which I'm going to introduce David about, and that's to involve the PFAS issue at Oakey. And I just wanted to bring da uh, David forward to actually talk to you about just the issues that he's had to deal with around his, his infringement of property rights. So I'll hand it over to David. Uh, <coughs> thanks, Ep. Thanks, everyone, for coming today. And thank you, Dan, and everyone spoken so far. I've, I've learned quite a bit just from you talking there. 
A uh, bit of a story on ourselves, on myself and my partner, Diane. Uh, I'm from Western Queensland, over 100 years, family on the land. Uh, worked in the mining industry, but mainly always been agriculture with cattle, breeding bulls and, and breeding bullocks. Early 2000s, my, my partner got MS. Anyway, we decided to uh, come to the Darling Downs where she could get the treatment and, and we could sort of not retire, but work into retirement with our kids and our grandkids. That was our dream. So we, we brought a place on the Darling Downs, uh, 2004. Everything was going well. We, did, we, we got the location right. We got the irrigation water right. We, we, could, we could breed good cattle. We could grow uh, loose and grow grain, do everything we wanted to. We, we ticked all the boxes. And, and uh, 2004, we got a notice in the mail to say there was a community meeting. So we went along to that and, uh, uh, sorry, 2014, there was, there was a community meeting, go along. So we went along and Defence Force were there. All the politicians from Canberra came up, Ian McFarlane, there was a heap of them there, and they said, we've got a problem. We have a chemical called PFAS and PFOA that we used on the defence base and it's been leaving the base into the underground aquifer and in the under, and overland flow. So three or four hundred people in the room were scratching our heads. We, we, we've never heard of this chemical before. Me as a beef producer, they're telling us that it, it gives you cancer, it gives you this, gives you that. And I'm thinking, as a food producer, what you're telling me they don't run in the same pen. You don't mix chemical, uh, especially these chemicals, with food. That's all right. You know, we haven't done anything wrong. Surely we'll get looked after. It'll be right. It'll work itself. We, we, we've got to... So we went home and we started doing research. And we researched, researched. We, we had went to Canberra, we spoke to politicians, we spoke to politicians at home, we had them. We had two years, we fought to get an outcome. We heard court was, on the, on, was coming in, we didn't want to go to court, we're country people, we can sort this out. Go and talk to people, if you've got a problem, you sort it out. We had lots of promises. Labor promised, if we get in, we'll sort this out in 100 days. Uh, Liberals and the Nationals, they said, if we get into power, we will sort this out in 100 days of being, being elected. Well, no one kept their promises. We thought when we bought a piece of land and we set up a business that we had a right for our own safety to run our business and, and to hand something on to our kids and our grandkids, to grow old with our family. But we found out we were actually poisoning our grandkids when they came out to our place. We were giving them a chemical that gives you cancer for being there. So we ended up in a class action, which we didn't want to be in a class action. Well, 2000, 2000, we've had six years fighting this. We fought and fought for an outcome, and I can tell you now, I've never seen a government fight so hard against people like myself in Oakey, Williamstown, and Catherine. So I still fight. I joined. One Nation, because One Nation, Malcolm's been fighting this for years. And he will not let it go, I know he won't. Because when I first told Malcolm, Malcolm, he, he, you, you said that wouldn't be right, would you? When they, took, when they took 60% of our creek water, Newman government, no money changed hands, they took it. Because they thought they were going to get the Green vote in Brisbane. They took allocation, 60%. And when I first told Malcolm that, you didn't really believe it, did you, Malcolm? You said, how? That wouldn't be right. I was stunned. He was stunned. 
and he's been stunned all the time we talk about PFAS. I'm stunned all the time I'm in the Senate. <laughs> That's what I'm stunned. And, 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 and when I spoke to Greg, we have a, we have a, a state government, LN, I won't mention, an LNP member, I will, he always said to me, it's not my problem. It came from federal land, you're on state land, it's not my fight. I said, but you're our state elected. He said, I'm not fighting for it, don't talk to me. He said that to the whole of Oakey. 4,000 people. And when Greg came along, Greg said, gee, I'm unhappy with the LNP. I'm thinking about standing for one nation. I said, we might have a fighter here. And I don't know if Greg gets elected, I think he will fight. I'm sure he will fight. But in this country now, they wear you down. They don't do it overnight. They do it slowly. With us, with us they're, they're doing it, they're cooking us, but they, they haven't eaten us up yet. We're going to keep fighting. They slowly, in our community of 4,000 people, we've got a defence community, we've got a meatworks, we've got agriculture, and we've got the townies. They turned our community neighbour against neighbour, they stood back and watched it, street against street, that group against that group. Women got abused in our town, they still do. I'm lucky I didn't get abused, but I can, I can, I can stand up for myself. But my partner did, with MS. And a lot of other women like her, because she stood up in a, in a defence town. Or they didn't like, because we were talking about taking the fight up. And you know what? Defence and government have never come out and said, we stuffed up. Not once. They've known about it for 25, 30 years. They brought it out. They have never once, no one has ever come from our government and said, we made a mistake here, we're going to fix it. Not once. They're not my government. They're not anyone, anyone that's been affected like me, they're not working for us. They've been elected to attack us. And that's what they've done. They've put us through hell. And I hope there's a class action going now, 40,000 people right across Australia, they're going to get the same as us. But we have done a lot of the hard lifting. But as, as property rights, I found out, well, you don't have any. As a father, a grandfather, I thought I had rights to have my family around me and know that I was looking after them. As a beef producer, I thought I had rights to send out that meat out the gate. It's the best article, clean green article, that I could produce. They told us we can't eat our veggies, we can't have chooks. We can't eat our meat to sell it on. And they still do that. They sell it on because it's cut up and it goes out. We've had the Australian Registered Cattle Breeders Association stand with us. We've had the Brahma Breeders Association stand with us, the Shaolay Breeders Association. Cattlemen from all over Australia said, take the fight, keep going. I said, I don't know how long we can keep going. We're, we're bucket. They said, you've got to keep going. There's only one thing that keeps us going is we can't stop and we have people like Malcolm, Dan, everyone else here that's starting to fight. That's what keeps us going. Sharon, sorry. Sorry. That's what keeps us going because there is more people starting to stand up. And I know there's people in this room are going to leave tonight and they're going to go home and they're going to have a look at their freehold lease or they're going to have a look at go what they're going to lose and what they're going to gain and they're going to stand up. But the trouble is there's not enough of them. There's not enough. And, and, and Malcolm's right. It's a slow proceed. It's one seat at a time. It's one voice at a time. 
and you've got to get the people fighting for you, more of them in the parliament, than the people that are attacking you. And at the moment, we are outnumbered. And they will keep going because they have agenda. Dan's done the homework. I've learned things today that I didn't know. They have got an agenda and they're going to keep going with it. So, I don't know, am I 10 minutes up? Thank you very much for listening to my story. And thank you for putting this on. And thank you everyone that's spoken. Because I've come along tonight and I've learnt a lot. Thank you.